Welcome to Sexy Boomer Show, Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet, and... Uh, I'm MC Ganey. Yes, our guest host. He's back for a second audition. Yeah, <laughs> last, and, uh, one, last one didn't work out too well, so we're going to try it again. Good. It was good, it was good, it was good. Phil Proctor, my uh, comrade in arms, is still gallivanting around Europe, and uh, he will be back. Uh, we'll both be back in a couple of weeks. What do you mean? Where are you going? I'm going to New Orleans. I'm going to the Jazz Fest. Oh, yes. speaking of the Jazz Fest, today is the 21st anniversary I got my marriage. My beautiful wife and I were married really? at the New Orleans Jazz Festival 21 years ago today. I believe you were standing there. I was right I there. was there as well. I, I believe you both were there. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And you were in my wedding party in 2000. Well, I was. That's right. I remember begging her, please think it over, think twice. Thank you. She, I appreciate that. She didn't listen. Yeah, no. Why would she? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery to me, I can tell you that. <laughs> I have to tell you, we have a wonderful treat in store for you today, Indeed. listening audience. We have now one of the great bon vivants of the modern world, the great actor and, and great humanitarian, Troy Evans. You will uh, certainly recognize his voice when you hear it because it's very unique. But he's also uh, uh, plays a character named Barrel on a TV show called Bosch. Is one of many, many, many jobs he's had. But it seems, many, to be, many. seems to be one that America loves him for. <laughs> you know, I printed out your uh, resume of all the, your credits. And uh, I said, gee, maybe I should print this out. 24 pages. How many, more how, than how, yours. How many has he got? How many? What number? Was Actually, I could tell you 426. 426 what? Jobs in Hollywood. Well, I saw somebody else put on uh, on Facebook they had 320 jobs. So I thought, boy, that's a lot. And so I went on and counted up my 400 and 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 over 400 jobs. And yeah. and the and the variety is is amazing. Yeah. And, and this the things you've done. Well, you're often a cop. You're uh, a lot. often. Often a cop, very, 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 very often. Is <laughs> the irony is so thick the, on that? Say, yes. <laughs> I, 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 MC, uh, you may recall, you and I shared an agent many years ago, <laughs> named uh, Dick Lovell. Indeed, God rest and his soul. And this is the late seventies when we were both starting out. Yeah, I, I was a twenty-nine year old alcoholic Vietnam vet, ex-convict from Montana. Who came to L.A. to find fame and fortune? So what were what were my chances? Not not too good, but we, Until they we got, got a look at you. But we got but we got with Dick Lovell, who handled uh, young character actors. That was his specialty. He loved the theater. We were both doing theater, and he loved young character actors. And uh, uh, to give you an example of Dick Lovell, I, I, I worked along pretty good for a while. And then I had sort of a hole and I went in to meet him. And so uh, agents love to do this, to call somebody while you're in the office so you can see them working. And he was pitching me for some job and the casting director didn't know who I was. And Dick said, oh, you know, he's like uh, kind of a stocky guy, short hair. Sounds like a man talking through a duck. <laughs> That's my agent. <laughs> how did you? How did you two meet? In church, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I worked at a theater north of Santa Barbara in a little town of Santa Maria called Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts, and it was largely populated by actors who came down from ACT, the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And the MC, home of great actors. Mm -hmm. MC was connected with that group. And then we ended up being roommates on uh, Clump Avenue in North Hollywood. Yeah, in the, Fort Clump. Yeah, 5151 <laughs> Clump. It was a beautiful, not beautiful, it was a big old rambling old house with about five bedrooms in it, small bedrooms, and Troy was the house master. He was there. People would come and go, and Troy was in, in charge of the house. And uh, I'm I was... I'm sorry. I was, yeah, oh, it was, you know, it was it was one of those, we've all been in that situation where there was some change every month, yeah. you know, trying yeah. to keep that keep that space filled for... Wow. Now, I, yeah. I uh, saw you perform your one-man show. Tall Tales from Montana. Yeah, yeah. at the VA in the, in the late 90s, I guess it was, or mid to late 90s. Yeah, it was the late 90s. And uh, a great show. Now, your story is so interesting um, and ironic that, you know, you, you're so probably best known playing police desk officer, <laughs> detective, cop. And here you are. Um, you came from a... a a really rough upbringing in in hard scrabble montana 
and you found acting because literally you felt that was one career where a felony uh, wasn't a deal breaker. Yeah, I, 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 when I decided to be an actor, I was actually in uh, uh, Montana State Prison, and uh, uh, and it dawned on me one day to give you an idea how much of a drunk I had been prior to that. I was in the prison for about six months before my head cleared enough that one day I went, oh, man, I bet I'm not going to be the governor now because that had been my goal is to be the governor of Montana. So then I started reviewing my, my options. Okay, I can't go back in the service. I owned a bar. I couldn't own a bar anymore. Uh, couldn't be a police officer. Couldn't be a teacher. Couldn't be an accountant. Couldn't, and one day it dawned on me, I'll bet nobody ever asks an actor if he's had a felony conviction. And that day, I sent what they call a, a kite uh, uh, to the warden asking for a copy of Hamlet. And I still have that as the stamp in the front. Inmate Evans, permission to have in his cell, Hamlet, signed Warden Blodgett. Wow. And the rest is our gain as audience. Isn't that something? Wow. No. Let's step back a little further. What got you in that predicament? Um, you served in Vietnam in the infantry. I did. And and I don't. I'm asking is it, you know, so many people I know that did serve in Vietnam really brought that war home with them, and it haunted them, and it really messed them up. And I'm wondering if it was. And I know you're probably not wanting to make excuses or anything, but you came back from the war. And you had a very successful business running a bar, owning a bar, in Montana. In Kalispell, Montana. Yes. Okay, so the powder keg, the powder keg. Named. To take us back to what, well, what happened. Uh, first of all, uh, before I was uh, uh, drafted, I was the first member of, of my family to go to college, and I was paying for college uh, with a rock and roll band which I'm still very proud of the name, Gang Green, <laughs> spelled G-R-I-E-N for no reason in particular, and, uh, and uh, frequently forgetting to go to class and uh -huh. having a wonderful time. So in th those days, see, now you, were dra you avoided the draft by getting a high number. I was drafted before they had the, the lottery. Mm -hmm. It was just you either kept your student deferment or you didn't. And you would think in that situation, it would occur to a bright young man, maybe I should get up in the morning and go to class. It would occur to a bright young man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I was having way too much fun. So I got drafted and sent over. And what I can remember connected to my later uh, difficulties is that I can remember consciously thinking, okay, I went to Asia I killed a bunch of rice farmers. I did what they asked me to do. Now, everybody better leave me alone. <laughs> and so if you cross me, uh, I was somewhat irrational frequently in my responses. Which, of course, was stoked by the alcohol. Uh, yes. Was the alcohol, yes. did it predate your Vietnam experience? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But but that really kicked it into into high gear. So you came you back know? angry and frustrated. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, when and and I I had a a bunch of contact with because I was constantly throwing people out of the bar, and uh, uh, and and being involved in bar fights and that sort of thing. And the the justice of the peace was my former boxing coach when I was in high school. So I would go over to Orville Fredenberg. And he would give me a stern lecture, and he would find me seventy-five dollars, and uh, and that happened a, n a number of times. And then a guy got out of line in the bar, and uh, he was a guy that I really didn't like. He was an attorney. He was the only guy in Northwest Montana with a Porsche, <laughs> and he was really obnoxious. Well, he was asking for it, wasn't he? And I, I broke both his legs and dislocated his shoulder, skull fracture, brain concussion, Jeez. hauled him up and just threw him out the front door out into the street. Because, Professional courtesy. Because, yeah, yeah. because he slapped his date. Yeah. Well, no, he grabbed a woman yeah. and then went, who was a friend of mine and grabbed her rear end 
And then when the husband objected, he he slapped the husband. And but I can still I mean this is over fifty years ago now, but I still have a vivid recollection. When I saw this happen from behind the bar, I had a two word response, which was far out. It was just an excuse for me to get this guy that I didn't like. <laughs> but that's when I found out when you do that stuff to an attorney, oh, yeah. it's no longer a $75 fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I realized they were going for real time. And so I went to my attorney and said, um, how about if I put myself in the alcohol program down in in the, the veterans hospital in Sheridan, Wyoming? My attorney said, well, Troy, uh, are you an alcoholic? And I remember this. I said, no, no, I'm not an alcoholic. But the beauty of it is since I drink a, like a fifth and a half a day, I think I can make them think I am. <laughs> Department of Clear Thinking. And they and that actually saved my life. It actually yeah. uh, worked. And I can remember the day about halfway through the 90 days. And I was and I was just on my very best behavior. I wanted to be the best patient they ever had, but I had deep. Uh, 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 I despised all these people. I was in this pro, all these these craven drunks, you know. And then one day, sitting in group therapy, and I heard one after another after another say things that were exactly what I said, <laughs> and a bell went off in my head. Oh my God. I'm an actor. I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm going to be an actor. No, and so so that actually saved my life. And uh, I went as long as we got this deep into this story. Uh, I got got back to to Bozeman, which where this this little debacle was taking place. And uh, I got there on got back home on Saturday. It went with my lawyer to meet the prosecuting attorney Monday morning. We agreed on a plea bargain where I do uh, uh, six years suspended. I plead, plead guilty, get six years suspended. Went into court. The judge, who was named W. W. Leslie, gave me forty years. You know they're not bound by the plea bargain. And I, I turned to my attorney and said. My God, what are we going to do? And the attorney said, oh, I don't know, Troy. He said, I, I have to move my office this afternoon, but best of luck to you. And he walked out. <laughs> the prosecuting attorney went up, tried to argue with the judge, say, Your Honor, this isn't. And the judge said, no, this young man, he used a gun. And, he's, and he said, no, no, Your Honor, there's no gun in this case. And uh, so, uh, fi but finally, the judge, who was 80-something at the time, uh, he said, well, all right, all right. Uh, he said, bring bring the defendant back. And they had me in shackles and stuff, and they were dragging me out of the courtroom. And <laughs> they bring me back. He says, now, uh, uh, what, what's what's the sentence he's supposed to have? And they said, six years suspended. He said, what did I give him? He said, you gave him 40 years, Your Honor. He said, all right, all right. He said, I'm, I'm resentencing the defendant, Troy Evans. Uh, 40 years hard labor plus six years suspended. So now I got 46. <laughs> and, and that actually, that little exchange, that's what saved me because the whole thing was so irregular. And later, it was way, it was only within the last few years that I found out there was this whole family secret. And my, my family, they were always, you know, my family were not the kind of family who would say, uh, you know, you, got, you just got screwed, you got such a bad deal. You know, they were the kind of family who say, you know, if you weren't such a drunk, you wouldn't be. But they were just churning about this. Turns out this guy, W.W. W. Leslie, had run for office three times in Silver Bow County in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, and all three times he'd been defeated by the same guy. Troy Evans. Troy Evans, yeah. my grandfather. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> so I, lucky me is right. So I, so I ended up down in, in, uh, in Deer Lodge, the Montana State Prison. Uh, and I was there about, about just about the same time I was, I was in Vietnam, a little shy of two years. And my family, uh, I mean, to this day, I think they think that it was just a terrible, horrible thing. But what I think is he didn't intend to. 
But W.W. Leslie saved my life because if I hadn't gone to prison, right. I don't know if it would have been three days or three weeks or three years or somewhere along the line, I would have said, well, I can have one beer yeah. mm-hmm. and and then, and then I would be dead somewhere because yeah. I cannot handle alcohol. So now I've been sober 52 years. So you walked out of the prison sober and you yeah. stayed sober. Yeah. One, and one... that gave me the opportunity. First of all, it really made the point – you want this life or do you want some other right. kind of life? Yeah, and he had a great voice in his ear, too, because he hasn't mentioned that his brother. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, uh, well, w- one of the things that helped with this, not everyone who gets uh, uh, perhaps an irrational sentence is going to get it before the sentencing commission and get all that because that's what it went to this commission and went threw it out and gave, you know, gave me time served. And the reason for that was that the parole officer at Montana State Prison uh, uh, was on it and was very supportive of me. And uh, that may have had to do with the fact that he was my brother. <laughs> so if you're going to go to prison, do it in a state with a small population. No kidding. I mean, what, I mean from yeah. what I understand, your upbringing was pretty hard scrabble. And northwestern Montana, uh, it's almost sounds textbook yeah. of, uh, you know, American frontierism. Uh, rough? Well, yeah. Now, now my parents both grew up in Butte, which was rough and tumble. Now, and, and it turns out that my fa- I, have, I have eight siblings, and um, we didn't know that we were poor. You know, we had what I would have considered a middle-class upbringing. Both my parents came up pretty rough. You know, but uh, uh, we were pretty middle class, and my, and and my brother is also a he was Navy, but he was he served in Vietnam, and he's uh, to this day a really cool, really wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Although, recent and and he and I uh, uh, look very similar. Oh, that's too bad. And uh, <laughs> uh, just recently, I was talking to him, and I said. To, uh, because uh, he's living back in Kalispell now. He, he lived in, in uh, Washington for many years. And I said, so do you run into a lot of, like, high school mates and stuff up in, uh, you know, when you're out in Kalispell? He said, no, not so much. He said, although uh, from time to time people <laughs> mistake me for a felon. Because <laughs> <laughs> he spent his life, his career as a uh, parole officer. As a parole officer? Yeah. So any of your eight siblings bake you a cake with a file in it? Uh, no. <laughs> well, not not exactly. Not metaf- Maybe metaphorically. Yeah. 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 Now, when I saw you do your one-man show, yes. you're an exemplary storyteller. You're really fantastic. Thank and you, you were, as I recall it, it was really sort of a cathartic experience for you to talk about what you what you went through and your struggles with i i believe it was just raising being raised going to vietnam having yeah. this trouble and cleaning yourself up and yeah. then getting back on your feet coming yeah. to california and, and having and, and having me for a roommate yeah <laughs> well you can't bat a thousand i guess <laughs> yeah i have to go back and address that little particular point so so uh, i moved into this house in Troy and he said but i have very few rules here i'm sure you'll you're you'll understand what they are as they come up they had a fireplace a beautiful fireplace, and but we, we didn't. We were a little short on firewood, and even shorter on money. So I would go out at night to construction sites, and I'm, if I happened to see a stack of wood, some of it would come home with me. <laughs> Troy came in one day, and I had a 25 foot two by four that I was slowly feeding into the fireplace. <laughs> he didn't like it too much, and there was a. He had a feral cat out under the front porch that he'd been feeding for like two years, and the cat had never. Never shown him any affection. <laughs> Troy can't show, don't worry about the cat. He's feral. I said, okay. The next day, Troy came home. I said, I thought you said that cat was feral. I went out and sat on the steps. He got in my lap. Troy said, the top of his head exploded. <laughs> so then I realized you can have a lot of fun with Troy Evans. You know what I mean? You got to keep poking him. Hey, uh, what do you guys think about the writer strike that started today? Um, I'm sick that they had to do it. I feel like they had to do it, absolutely. And it probably will be the uh, directors next and the actors after that. Right. The because actors and SAG after and the Directors Guild come up in June. All our unions are in trouble. It's harder and harder. The residuals are gone in our business. And the head of Warner Brothers got paid $250 million last year. Mm-hmm. They can't afford to pay 
a decent wage for writers and directors and actors, but the head, the one guy who one guy whose butt sits in one chair and runs Warner Brothers is going to get two hundred fifty million dollars. Well, writers have just traditionally been probably the most abused professional class in this town. And <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to two working actors yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, you know, no. definitely challenge that yeah, if you'd no, like. Yeah. Um, we're, we're all we all get our day in the bucket. Okay, that's absolutely true. But uh, yeah, I'm sick that it's come to this, but it, it has, and this is, this is what it is. I'll be uh, limping along on the picket line as soon as I can find one. Mm. Even though SAG cannot, we cannot refuse work. We 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 we're sworn. Our contract says we cannot strike. Until before June thirtieth, the end of uh, our until contract. you're authorized. Yeah, yeah. We can't we can't strike. We if we we don't have that right. But the the implications of this strike are immediate. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think we're in a heyday of late night comedy right now. Oh yeah, and it's all gone now. Everybody's shut down. Everything's yeah. closed down. Well, there's always going to be something good about anything bad situation that happens. <laughs> <laughs> God. So, I mean, Troy, as long as they don't I mean, mess with the young this, and the restless, ultimately, if it goes long, could put you, you could put you guys out of work. Oh yeah, so, oh absolutely, yeah, yeah, and 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 I, I don't doubt at all that there are uh, are people amongst the the producers who would just as soon uh, tear the whole thing to the ground. Yeah, break all the unions and and, and just. Uh, uh, start you know just ju- just start over with without unions and I think they're probably uh, high end actors who would who would I, I, shame on me for even saying that but there are people who don't care they're getting theirs and they don't see why they have to abide by union really? rules so other people get paid yeah. so it it's it's always rough I mean the industry landscape has changed radically with streaming thanks to the internet yeah and all the distribution models are upended. And residuals were a big part of, of the compensation plan. Oh, yeah. And continue to be, but they've been slowly eroded because for people who don't understand what's happening, you know, obviously much of the content we watch is not so much in theaters and on standard television anymore, but streaming networks. Yes. And they are upending the model and they are reducing the amount of episode content. I mean, I was watching uh, Perry Mason fantastic and it ended after eight eight episodes yeah. and so the writers are saying you know that that's disruptive they're reducing the size of the writing rooms we're not getting residuals on the streaming and it's as if the industry has decided or the people the, the power behind the industry are saying well we're not going to grow the rest of the unions with us no. we're going to try to leave them behind i mean is that is it really that craven Yes. Well, yeah, and, and I I think it probably always has been, but that, and so that that battle will go on uh, forever. But there, you know, it's a, you know you talk about the about the streaming yes. like it used to be on on network television, do twenty two or twenty four episodes, yeah. then they went to streaming, it's ten, then that was too much. Now they're doing eight mm-hmm. eight episodes. That's a season. So if you're a working actor. Like MC and I have been, you know, we we don't make series regular money, but if uh, like I had years on ER as a recurring character with a middle class wage, basically doing out of twenty two episodes, I'd get fifteen, sixteen episodes. Well, those jobs don't exist anymore. You know, you remember you were working on a series. I think it was you that, and you were like one episode away from being elevated to a, a exactly a regular. So I was a guest star for eight episodes or nine episodes, well, ten episodes, and and, and uh, the last episode I was one episode away from being made a regular, and they canceled the series. But the only reason I'm, I'm not complaining about that. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. But when that show reruns now, I get two cents per episode huh. as residuals. Now, this amazes me on two levels. One, that what am I supposed to do with two cents? And another, how can they how can they justify sending me something, spending 46 cents to send me a two cents check? And how can they support uh, the necessary pension and health care and retirement There's plans that, too. that you, you both have funded significantly over the years? Yeah, absolutely. Good right. question. Which, uh, now, I, you know, I've just gone through that, you know, for... Uh, Almost 50 years, I was in Screen Actors Guild, and the deal was, if you were, uh, you have to make a certain amount every year to be on the health plan. Right, right. But if you were on the health plan for 20 years during uh, in any order during your career, 
say, every other year for 40 years, that then when you retired, you would be on the health plan. And then here about a year ago, just about the time I retired, they just said, oh, we're not doing that anymore. Go, yeah. go, oh, they re- were, go yeah. sign up for Medicare. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. in SAG, and I was challenged twice by some 20-year-old who was just trying to clean the roster off, you know, and, yeah. I, and I was legit. But yeah. I had to write a letter, a three-page letter to the head of the Screen Guild in New York and just yeah. said, here's what I'm doing. What's going on? Got a call from the office apologizing. So it's, it's you know, it, they're under pressure because their costs are skyrocketing. And so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. This, speaking of which, this is a sexy boomer show. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and my co host, my guest co host, MC Ganey, who's in for Phil Proctor. I am. I am uh, doing the best I can to fill his seat and uh, <laughs> and keep it warm for him until he gets enough of European touring and yes, traveling. Yes, yes. He'll be the here cheese soon. Cheese Museum in Amsterdam. Cheese and, Museum. Yeah. And our guest today is actor Troy Evans, who uh, I enjoyed you so much in the Bosch series. on, uh, And that was an Amazon project production. Yes. And that was a streaming production. How different was that? for you I, I was quite amazed when i got on that because uh, i've done quite a bit of, of network television you know and of course the probably the the pinnacle of my career was working nine years on er as uh, frank the desk clerk and uh and then when i when i got hired by amazon to do to do a recurring part on that Bosch series i expected a uh, it to be way pared down in terms of comfort and the way, and it was just the same. Well, they have more money than God. Yeah, but they. It's not uh, about the money. I didn't, but I didn't expect them to be Spend spending it. it that way. It, it was very comfortable. Uh, great uh, scripts. High, really highly skilled. All great, the technicians. Great scripts. Great stories. Great. Great, great production directors. quality. Beautiful. And, uh, and I, I want to mention. Michael Connolly is a prince. He is indeed. He's just uh, uh, generous and unbelievably talented and productive and courteous and modest. And uh, I just really, and his world is exploding. I just see they've announced. Michael well, Connolly, the Bosch is uh, based on a series of his books. It's an amalgamation of his books. Right. And um, Michael Connolly was a writer for the LA Times. Yes, you know, crime writer. And so crime writer, and this is how he evolved into writing best-selling crime right. novels, which then were developed into television shows, Bosch being one, which ended its run. Fantastic show. What's next with all that? Well, so so they did seven seasons of, of, of Bosch, which is based on this LAPD homicide detective, Harry Bosch, and then they spun it off in what they call Bosch Legacy, where... Um, uh, Harry Bosch is now a private detective, and now just in the last couple of days, I've seen these uh, news reports. They they're doing another spinoff. Uh, one is the Renee Ballard spinoff. Renee Ballard is is a, a another uh, Michael Connelly character who's a woman who's a uh, LAPD homicide detective who runs the cold case unit. And so they're going to be doing a series about the cold case detectives. And then they're going to be doing another series in Miami with Jamie Hector, who uh, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the viewers will know, either from or your listeners, either from uh, Bosch or from The Wire that he was on. And he will be an undercover cop in uh, Little Haiti in, uh, uh, in Florida. So uh, the Michael Connolly world is... Exploding, and the one thing it has in common is great quality, and it's because of the guest actors they have. I myself had the pleasure of being a <laughs> guest star on Bosch, in which uh, I got to play the best friend of Barrel, uh, Troy Evans' character, and uh, we had a scene, uh, a scene together. If, if I never work again, this will be one of my all-time favorite sweet flavors. Was sitting in uh, in the Musso Frank. Uh, uh, that was a lovely evening. I, wasn't I, it? I was a, at that point. I was a retired homicide detective, and I'm sitting right. and talking to my friend, and we're laughing and joking about the hard times and what went on during the riots and all kinds of things, and and uh, talking about yeah, it's, but, uh, this is the part of this. This is the job, and it's the thing. And we walk out in the parking lot to leave and go home, and I fall down and have a heart attack. <laughs> and, I mean, it's like uh, I wake up in the hospital, and Troy's sitting next to my bed, like my wife. Speaking of wives, uh, did I mention today's my wedding anniversary? I can't go. 
to let yeah. that go by. <laughs> yeah. with, with, I can't let that go by without mentioning that Troy is also married. Troy's married to a blacksmith. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, yeah, nice shoes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, okay, now, now Heather, my wife, Heather McClarty, is an artist blacksmith. Indeed. Uh, but she World also... World famous. Mm-hmm. She also has... Uh, she's the president of a nonprofit called Adams Forge. Yes. And Adams Forge runs a blacksmithing school over in Lincoln Heights. And it, this isn't like a school you go to for nine months and learn how to shoot horses. This is where they teach, like... Uh, to make uh, beautiful ornaments, uh, gates, railings, but uh, individ- like you'd, you'd look on their website and maybe go in next weekend and learn how to make a letter opener. So blacksmithing is just really working with hot metal. It's it's working hot metal with a hammer, shaping yeah. it. Yeah. But you know, you know, uh, one of the things that Heather did that's so impressive is uh, they, she found out. I don't know exactly how, so I can tell you that in South America there were countries that had lost this blacksmithing skill. And these these cities that had beautiful wrought iron balconies and everything that were falling apart, and nobody knew how to fix them. So she uh, got organized a group, and they went down and and uh, and restored blacksmithing. Uh, yes, they it it started, and uh, uh, Buenos Aires, you know, is is filled with that old, beautiful old uh, European style uh, uh, metalwork, and a friend of Heather's. A guy named Jerry Coe went down there because he went. He went there. He's he's a blacksmith, but he's also a, a dancer, and he and he went to to dance, uh, and in in Buenos Aires, and and was looking at at all this beautiful metalwork, and said, "Well, I got to meet some of the blacksmiths." Well, it turns out, when the Great Depression hit here, it hit much harder in South America, so. That whole world was destroyed. Nobody could afford to hire somebody to make them a beautiful uh, window treatment or a, a railing. Everything was sold off. Everything was melted down. All the tools were gone. And so Jerry Coe brought with, he found one young guy who was trying to blacksmith. He was trying to teach himself how to do it, brought him back. For several months, he went. He spent a, a few weeks at our house and at Jerry's house, all over California, different blacksmiths' homes, learned these different skills. Then he went back, and the following year, Heather and Jerry Coe and like 25 other blacksmiths all went down to Buenos Aires, and they spent two weeks there, and they uh, built a big sculpture in a park in the middle of the of the city and people came from all over and started started working with them and they taught them and they all took they, they didn't take anything with them except tools all of their luggage was all tools when they left they left all the tools mm-hmm. there and and then they went back this happened maybe 10 years ago mm-hmm. and they went back three or four years ago and at that time there were about 400 blacksmiths wow. going in in Buenos Aires wow and then and uh uh, th- that young guy who came up here, Jericho brought up here, has been back up to visit us, and there it's just. You, you, besides acting, you have an artistic streak as well. You, you were making teepees, and as a teepee owner, I always admired what you were making. Oh no, kidding! Oh, oh, you have one in Colorado, I bet. Up in Utah. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in Utah. In the mountains, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and well, I got into the teepees because uh, when we got our house in Highland Park. Uh, uh, it's a historic uh, house, and we needed to put up a, a a shop for Heather to forge in, but we're very limited in what we could do. I said, well, if we put up a teepee for you to forge in, then it's clearly portable. It can come down at any time. So I started making teepees uh, uh, because... <laughs> Well, it's kind of. <laughs> no, you know, I, I don't, don't you, stop yourself. I, I, I don't know Why did you start making TV? I, I don't know right? if you've heard about this, but sometimes actors are between opportunities. No. So uh, I just uh, we decided we get a teepee. We we do a teepee, and I said, "Well, I'll, I'll make it," you know. So <laughs> Heather said, "Well, have you ever sewed anything?" I said, well, I've sewed on buttons and stuff. She said, well, you know, making a teepee, that's a little different. I said, no, no, I could. So I, I, then I, I got online and I bought, because uh, I'm a, a genius, I bought four industrial sewing machines 
and a whole bunch of canvas and thread and all this stuff and and uh, and a book. How to build a teepee. And started and started <laughs> making teepees. And I've uh, and then uh, well I've made probably fifty or sixty over wow. the years. My my teepees are ingenious. It's the only tent structure where you can have a fire inside. That's a big deal. Yes. If you have it on the Great Plains and there's a strong wind, the wind actually pushes the tent down on Right. The... It's one of the safest structures to be in. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, this I'm just bragging now, but uh, outside Glacier National Park, uh, the western entrance, uh, there's a group called the Glacier Institute, and they're the people who, the nonprofit that supports Glacier National Park, and they have a... Uh, a 20-foot lodge, which, uh, what size is yours? 17. 17. Yeah. So, you know, 20 foot is That's a big, substantially yeah. bigger. Yeah. And it's this beautiful teepee sits out there, and they have their literature and their stuff in it. And I made that teepee. Nice. Did you really? Yeah. The Glacial uh, Institute. That sounds I heard they uh, call it a wigwam. Is it a wigwam? A or wigwam teepee? is a different thing. Oh, okay. Was was uh, uh, just, either way? It's two tents. When when it's what? Two tents. Relaxed. <laughs> okay. Oh, two tents. Oh God! Now when now MC, I assume once in a while is between jobs too. Is, does he ever come over <laughs> as an apprentice with you? And is is he handy that way? Uh, well, I don't know how know you how well you know MC. Way but, too much. Uh, way too. He, uh, way too much. MC isn't too big on doing, no. doing stuff. No, no stuff. <laughs> no. no. I'm He'll still, do chair testing. I'm still yeah, waiting. I've seen that. <laughs> still waiting for that first hobby to rear its ugly head. I like to play poker. Yeah, that's yeah, doing something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of playing poker, world class poker player right here, Troy really? Evans. Oh yeah, I'm not. For, uh, it, it's gone though. It's gone away from you, huh? Yeah, I, I, I haven't I played for years. Well, you know, it took me a long time to realize that you know, you know there's that thing that they've discovered with with. The majority of poker players, yeah. they get an adrenaline rush yeah. when they lose. <laughs> oh and man! That's what keeps them hooked. Really? That, yeah, that that thing. And then I found after playing for years and years and years, I you know I started playing when I was an actor making a hundred dollars a week, and I'd go to the poker rooms at night and try to turn it into two hundred dollars. And uh, try being the operative word. Uh, yeah, although I, I, you know, I, I was a pretty no. tight player. I played yeah. pretty, and I and I played low ball, which yeah. is a pretty simple game. If you'll play by the rules, you can win at low ball usually. Mm -hmm. But I finally figured out I I was not happy. I that, there's that phrase, "Go home talking to yourself." When I lost, but I was even less happy when I won. Because there's some schmuck over there. I know he's got six kids at home who, who mm -hmm. don't have clothes to go to school, and I've got his money in my pocket, so I quit playing. Speaking of uh, bleak scenarios and gambling, <laughs> when uh, MC visited us with a group of guys, yeah. we'd have an annual retreat up in uh, up at the cabin, and um, he announces that we're going to have a poker game. He goes, call your friends, you know, my local friends. And I was like, oh, okay. And they come over, and everybody wants to meet the big MC, you know, everybody, you know, so he gets a lot of mileage out of that. He brings him in. He says, hey, come on over Thursday. We're not playing for money on Thursday. Just come over and play. We're just going to have a fun game, right? Yes. Pulls him in. You can hear the fishing reel, you know, being wound. And then, and then he said, hey, let's do it again tomorrow. Let's do it for money tomorrow, you know? And he's, Bonnie, are you going to play? I was like, no, I'm going to sit out on the deck. <laughs> I'm not going to get involved in this. And they're going for hours. There's a couple of refugees sitting with me on the on the deck and listening to this. And uh, a couple of my friends, you know, just got cleaned out, you know. So the next morning, I ask MC, I say, hey, I, what, do you, what do you think of my buddy uh, Kranich? He goes, he's a good donor. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ruthlessness that it takes to be a good and poker He may player. have six kids, but yeah. that's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once, uh, once when I was... Uh, up in, uh, uh, I mentioned Santa Maria up at Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts. And then at night after the, like a show would go down at 1130 at night, then I would drive up to Napomo to a place called Joe's Not In. That's just how they would answer the phone. <laughs> Joe's, Joe's Not, not in. in. And they had two poker tables in there and I would play, mostly playing these old farmers who hung around there. And so, and it was, it was 
a relatively small game, two, four, two and four dollar bets, you know, and uh, trying trying to turn my hundred dollars into two hundred dollars, and and it got to be like four o'clock in the morning. I'm stuck like four or five hundred dollars in this game, and there was one huge pot. Everybody had a hand. Everybody was in. It's over six hundred dollars in a pot, and I won. Yeah, and it was mm. such a relief. I got that money, and I jump up and I'm celebrating like Muhammad Ali. And one of these old farmers says, "says Troy, don't act like an idiot." And one of the other farmers said, "Oh, he ain't acting." <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard that I've heard people say that about Troy a million times <laughs> but not about playing poker oh, all right thank you I'm here all weekend uh, so what are you guys up to the, are you are you working on anything right now uh, no no I'm I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just plugging along and I'm uh, you know people have told me for years you should write your stories down you should write your stories down and yeah and uh, I'm sort of trying to do that. Well, you but, can't do that. It's my job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> MC is working on what he calls uh, the autobiography of Troy Evans by MC Ganey. <laughs> but so, so I'm trying to do that. Trying mm-hmm. to collect because one of these days I, I'm 76, mm-hmm. and uh, it's occurred to me I'm not going to live forever. Hmm. So somebody might I- enjoy the stories if I got them written down. But it's very hard because. Yeah. You but know, the when, stories roll out of you so easily. Right, right. But I have my voice. I have the pause. Right. I have the. I feel the temperature of the room. I have, and now this is radio. But ordinarily, I have the eyebrows. I have the side look. I have all those tools. When I'm writing it down, <laughs> you don't have that. Right. You right. Know? So that's it. Uh, that that's difficult for me. Are you re- are you interested at all looking back at Montana now when you've been away for so many years? And one of the benefits of being where we are is that we have the power of reflection and seeing changes, long term changes. In uh, you know certainly that part of Montana even isn't anything close to the way it was fifty years ago. No, no, it's it's very. Uh, uh, if, if you're a right wing person. You're very, very happy in in Montana now, and if you're not, you're actually in physical danger. It's seriously. Uh, oh yeah, it's. Uh, and yet, John Tester, your friend, yes, manages to get elected over and over and over again because he's uh, a, a you know a Democrat, but a straight talking farmer who mm-hmm. happens to be a Democrat. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good man. So, how do you explain for the 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 duality? Yeah, how does he of that? get elected, Troy? Well, I, I mean, for one thing, he's he's a known quantity. Yeah. He's also uh, he's not a. I mean, he he's very liberal for Montana, yeah. but he's not very liberal compared to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and uh, and he's and and he he's got a, a great manner and uh, and, I mean, and, I, and I'm not saying this facetiously. You know, he he's missing a couple of fingers from. Uh, uh, farm accidents, and he got that flat top. Yeah, he's got that flat top, right. and he and he and he's you know, he rebuilds his own truck and he, he so truck he's, engine. He's, and he's on brand. He's on he's on brand, and and I think he's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. Now we'll see how he does this year, but they're they're going to drag somebody out to try to pull him down. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, they're they're. they're uh, what do you think? I mean, what what's your take? Uh, you're politically astute. You've been observing things for years. What is your take on uh, where where we're headed? What, what the state of the country right now? Oh, I I hate to even speculate. I uh, I do, I do feel like the uh, the direct Trump support is finally eroding, but the complete. Uh, whack job support is still there. It's just going to to other other people. It is, and and what I think is that you know that possibility has always been there, but it's the the fact that that you can really pick and choose your media today. You can, I mean, you can find. I mean, you can you can just go on the internet and get straight up Nazi content. So it's yeah. very That's tribal now. It's very what? tribal. Very, very tribal. I, I have one hope. One, one, one ace in the hole in all this is Gen Z. 
uh, the young people. The young people are not upset because their their friends are trans. They're 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 not upset because they want to have a right to control their bodies. They're not upset. The young people are the hope here. Mm-hmm. And if they if in it, it, getting them to vote has traditionally been a problem because mm-hmm. they're they're not dug in with paying taxes and paying for their home and everything. But I think they're now attuned to voting and, and to their power. And I, ex- I expect them to come roaring out here in the next election. I, I hope I agree. I hope the same because I, you know, the one hope I have is that these the young ones are post social media. They're going to see it for what it is. They're hopefully evolve out of wow. that. I hope you're right. And they have true concerns, not just existential concerns, because the planet's climate is changing radically. Yeah. They don't have time to mess around. It's it's so embarrassing that uh, that. The, the people in power can't seem to uh, do their job. And well, and, and people, you know, uh, uh, at, at lunch we mentioned a, a couple of these people who are far-right uh, politicians who spread this nonsense, who, are, who have Ivy League degrees, multiple Ivy League degrees. They know. You can't tell me that Ted Cruz doesn't know mm-hmm. that – uh, that global warming is having a deleterious effect all over the world. Particularly he just in his doesn't care. Particularly in his district. Yeah. You know. and, and yeah. He just did, doesn't did you, care. That's exactly it. Did you see what happened in, in Fort Lauderdale about 10 days ago? Yes. The, 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 the flood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you know how much rain they had? Yeah, they had two feet in like t- two hours or something yeah. like that. 25 inches of rain in, in two hours. Yeah. But that, oh, that global warming, that's a hoax. Yeah. I think they're, that's I don't, biblical. I don't think that they're even saying that anymore because they, they really just can't, can't say that it's a hoax. I yeah. mean, when, it, when it's affecting every aspect of society from Their severe back, weather to, to increased air turbulence, yeah. you know, Their fallback I mean, everything's position. changing. Their fallback position is not so much that it's a hoax now, it's that it's not man-made. It, it really is happening. Yes, you know, you're not imagining that it's raining more, and so, but it's not. It's not because we're using uh, diesel cars. No, not at all. No, no. you know. No. Hey, uh, let's lighten the let's lighten the mood, shall we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Please. Let's go back to please. Troy in prison. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> let's go back to the alcoholism. We, we haven't well, mind that. We haven't mind that uh, prison time yet. All right. What's, but, but, but you know, you know, let, this this is random, but I'll tell you. Because we we talked about the unions and we talked about – so I had gotten in the uh, Actors' Equity, which is a stage actors' union. And then that allowed me to get into the Screen Actors Guild when I came to, to town without without getting a job, you know, just from a sister union. So I saved up my money and got in that. And, and it was much easier to get on the health plan in those days. And in those days, then they sent you to a thing called the Life Extension Institute. Mm. And they would do a complete physical and a psychological workup. So they knew everything about me, my, my, my blood pressure, my, that I was a, a Vietnam vet, which, you know, v- veterans think that's, that's not considered good for your health, and the alcohol and the prison and all that stuff is all in the thing. And then they work that all up into a, a thing and give you a plan to, to, for, for a long, healthy life. And they said... If I exercised and got sleep and ate right and didn't drink, I could expect to live to be 35. I was 29 <laughs> at the time. Hey, you know, one thing, <laughs> one thing going way back in the days now, back before Troy could make a living as an actor in this town, he had a very, what I consider a very interesting job. Oh, are you, are you like talking it? about the Sherry Lewis I job? I am. Please tell us about Sherry Lewis. That was a wonder, wonderful thing. I was For those of you who remember Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, I was Sherry Lewis's gopher, no pun intended, for a couple of years. I was Lamb Chop's chauffeur, and that Lamb Chop's <laughs> fluffer. <laughs> yeah, 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 and that and that's how I survived my first couple of years in Hollywood. Yeah. Wow. There's something so bizarre about that to me. <laughs> you know, somebody could meet Lamb Chop and see the lovely Sherry Lewis operating, and she takes off the and hands it to Troy. <laughs> 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 Uh, <coughs> real responsibility. Yes, yes. Those were that, that was that was a wonderful job, though. That was. And a lamb chops got to be like eighty five years old now. Eh? Yeah, yeah. St- still you, on the health plan. Though. You have uh, a story that would be represent perhaps one of the most ironic, uh, absurd, 
ridiculous, possibly embarrassing experiences you had in your time in Hollywood? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you quick. The, I, the, the one that comes to my mind is there was a guy named uh, Bobby Hoffman. And Bobby Hoffman was the king of comedy. He was the guy who, who cast Happy Days. And, and, uh, and uh, all those uh, cheers and all those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah he could, because yeah, once, he, once he cast Happy Days, then uh, he was known as the king of comedy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if they could get him, they got him to cast. Mm -hmm. And our agent I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the late, great Dick Lovell, uh, got me a, a meeting with Bobby Hoffman, not an audition, but just a general meeting. So I go in, his offices were over at Paramount, and I sit down, and I'm happy to have, you know, those happy to have any kind of a meeting and be there and meet this big-time casting director. And, of course, he, he sweats me in the chair for about 20, 25 minutes and takes some phone calls and in and out of the room and stuff. Finally, he sits down. Uh, he picks up my resume. He says, well, Troy, he said, Let, let's look at, let's see what you have here. And he looks at the, at the resume. He says, oh, you're with Dick Lovell. I said, uh, yeah. He said, that's a good agent. That's a good agent. I thought, wow, I, I like hearing this. And he leans across the table and right eyeball to eyeball. He says, you know, He's got really good actors, and they don't cost a freaking thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> Dick Lovell was the king of the king of the under fives, yeah, the king of the under fives. He was very. He, you know, Troy went to him one time. <laughs> Tell him what you said when you wanted him making money, Troy. I love that. I, I don't remember. Oh, he went to said Dick. Uh, Dick, I feel bad. I'm not not making enough money here. I want to make money for you. You're a great agent. I want to make money. Dick said, "Don't worry, I, I'm rich." <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about me. He, he, <laughs> yeah. he had not gotten rich from being an agent. He just he had he was wealthy. Yeah. And uh, he was very happy being an agent in a niche spot. Well, he could go out to theater and find new people who had not broken in and bring us over and make you audition. If he thought you could get out and read for under five line parts, then he would sign you up and send you out. And he, But you never had any record. The phone would ring at 9 o'clock. He'd say, yeah, uh, MC, uh, you're going over to MGM this afternoon at 3.30 for a, a part on uh, T.J. Hooker. And he said, well, I mean, that's it. That's all you needed to know. You find the MGM, get the two pages of the sides and see what cop number three or whatever and read it. And that's how he did business. And a, a lot of casting directors actually let Dick uh, cast the parts. He'd call you up and say, okay, you're on Days of Our Lives tomorrow. You're cop number two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> be there at 6 a.m. Don't chew gum. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you go, I love it. And when Dick Dick passed, he he passed a few years ago, and we found out about it. And, and Troy and I and, and a wonderful friend of ours, Will Ute, who was also a Dick Lovell client and did a lot of stuff, we all went and spoke uh, at at, at, yeah. Troy, at uh, Dick Lovell's funeral. And uh, we we had we had so much circus. We had a great deal of love for this guy because he discovered us after a sense. But he really was not interested in moving you anywhere up the ladder. If you were willing to stay with him for twenty years and keep doing under five line parts, he'd be fine with that. <laughs> not not a problem. He'd be glad to have you come around. A wonderful guy, though. Wow. Uh, so he discouraged ambition. Oh, he, oh. Uh, he was indifferent. Oh, to absolutely. It. And I, I, after several years there. Uh, a woman named Michelle Gallery saw me in a play and wrote a guest starring part for me on L.A. Law that was spectacular. And so I got, I didn't have to audition. I got that part and did this, you know, I'd never, I'd never auditioned for a guest starring part, let alone had one, you know, and then that, so I, I took that opening to to move on to another agency and went in to tell Dick that I was leaving, going to a, to a different agency. And he said, he said, why are you doing this? I said, Dick, I want to do big parts on television. I want to be in movies. He said, <laughs> well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> <laughs> I would have chased you out of here long ago. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, it was, uh, he was a wonderful guy and it was, he approached me backstage while I was doing a play and said, I think we could uh, we could make some money. I think you've got a future in this business. And I thought, well, make some money. Even scale plus 10, you know, was better than, uh, I was a doorman at the Biltmore Hotel. There wasn't a lot of money in that. 
<laughs> Troy was uh, putting uh, pork chop to bed every night, lamb chop <laughs> to bed every night. So it was, uh, you know, even scale was good money. But it was a wonderful way to just get in the business, you know, just mm-hmm. get out there and get your feet wet and start doing it. You know what's great about it is that it, the, the people that this business attracts and the characters yeah. and yeah. The, the smart people this business attracts. And you have things you just couldn't get elsewhere like the two of you and your, your endless relationship, friendship goes so, so deeply. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, to sit at the table and listening to you two go at it. It's, uh, it's special. It's nice. Yeah. And, you know, MC I have no and- higher. I have no higher praise I can say for any friend that I'm going to steal every joke, every story ever told, <laughs> every anecdote that ever happened to him. I've, I've, I've absorbed them all. I mean, literally, oh, people, that's have, come, you got people have come to Troy and say, "Oh, I know you're a friend of MC Ganey," and he told me about when he did this, and Troy go, "It didn't happen to him." <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, he, he, he just gave me this thought, and and this goes out to every young actor out there suffering, and I can tell you this with absolute certainty. That any time, and, and you get jobs, and you've, I, I've been on jobs and, and been very unhappy and felt guilty about it, you know, that I, I should appreciate that I have this, but there are things that aren't right about it. But let me say to every actor out there, any day you're spending uh, on, a, on a set in Hollywood is guaranteed to be better than working on the pig farm at Montana State Prison. And on that note... <laughs> Wonderful, Troy. Thank you, oh. Troy Evans. Thank you so much for coming oh. on and joining us. And uh, well, it's so nice. It's and, and thank thanks for having me. I uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. MC Ganey, thank you for being yeah. a delightful co-host. Uh, it's been my pleasure, and uh, I look forward to doing it again the oh, next yeah. next time Phil Proctor Just goes to Italy. <laughs> we'll be back next week with a with a fantastic show. I'm going to be talking to Noel Blank, Mel Blank's son, oh, Mr. I'll be Looney Tune. In. The stories you're going to hear. Oh, That's Mel fantastic. Blank's son, huh? Yeah. Wow. Fantastic story. If you don't know who Mel Blank is, Google it. This is the Sexy Boomer Show, Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. Phil Proctor will be back soon. Uh, and until then, have a wonderful week. You can hear all these shows on our website, sexyboomershow.com. So long. Have fun, Phil. Have fun, Phil.